So when it comes to thinking in Spanish, this is something you already know how to do. Whether you're a beginner, intermediate or advanced student, thinking in Spanish is something you already can do, at least on a small scale. And I'll show you what I mean. If I take any of the following phrases, ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo te llamas? Mucho gusto. Now, most students I have ever worked with will be able to use at least one of these in a conversation, even though we can't translate them directly. Like if we put mucho gusto into Google Translate, we get nice to meet you. Yet as a word for word translation, mucho means much or maybe a lot, and gusto means taste, liking, or pleasure. So if a student can use mucho gusto without having to literally translate in their head, it demonstrates an ability to think in Spanish. So the real question is, how do we scale it up? How do we get better at thinking in Spanish? Well, to start with, if you can use mucho gusto in a conversation, a really important question is, how did you learn it? Did you learn it from a YouTube video or did you find it in a book? Did you ask a Spanish friend? Hey, how do you say nice to meet you in Spanish? After that, maybe you wrote it down or maybe you used it once or twice in a conversation. And now the phrase is available in your long-term memory for when you need it next. Now, as a Spanish teacher, I believe that the way the Spanish gets into your head doesn't actually matter that much. Method is not that important. The only thing that matters is that the Spanish does make it into your head and that it stays there. And the things that have worked for learning ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo te llamas? And mucho gusto will work for you to learn the whole language. You just need to scale up your efforts. Now, on some level, this will happen naturally. As you keep studying the language, your ability to think in the language will improve with time. That said, there are some things that we do to sabotage ourselves with how we study the language, and I'll explain what that looks like. So there are two main symptoms that come with, let's call it poor thinking in Spanish. The first is literal word-for-word -word translations from English when they don't work at all in Spanish, and then slow, broken speech. And the problems associated with these symptoms are not knowing enough Spanish yet, too much logic-based decision-making. Now, in the first case, with literal word-for-word -word translations, this simply means a student doesn't know how to express an idea in Spanish yet, or maybe they've forgotten something they've already studied, or they are currently wrestling with a new idea. So for example, if you want to ask someone, what is your name in Spanish? We saw earlier that we can say, ¿Cómo te llamas? But we can also ask, ¿Cuál es tu nombre? ¿Cuál es tu nombre? Now, I once had a student get really angry at me. He said, Andrew, why can't I say, ¿Qué es tu nombre? What's wrong with that? Why can't I just say that? Now, if you do ask in Spanish, ¿Qué es tu nombre? A Spanish nerd will understand the question. It's just that it's a literal translation from English and it's not how the Spanish language deals with this question. Now, in situations like these, I often flip the problem so a student can see in their own language what's happening in reverse. So I would ask the student something like, why can't we say, which is your name in English? Hi, nice to meet you, which is your name? Now, of course, the student will say, well, that's not how we say it in English, but the student might keep pushing anyway. In Spanish, ¿qué means what? So why can't we use it here? ¿Qué is what? What is your name? ¿Qué es tu nombre? Why doesn't it work? Now, often I think this is a very natural part of the language learning process, that sometimes we have to wrestle with new ways of thinking. Then over time, the student will naturally get used to the cual es pattern. So what is your secret? ¿Cuál es tu secreto? ¿Cuál es tu secreto? What is the plan? ¿Cuál es el plan? ¿Cuál es el plan? Then, once the student has developed an ability to think in Spanish using the cual es pattern, the next step is they need to find another pattern and then keep the process going. Now, if you do have to wrestle with something in Spanish, you know, a new way of thinking, then so be it. It happens. I've been there and I've had to go through it too. But a solution I've offered in the past to help students reduce the wrestling and fighting with new ways of thinking, at least something that's worked really well for me, is to stop asking why questions. In this example, the student kept asking me, why can't I say, ¿Qué es tu nombre? Why? Why can't I say that? Why not? And the answer to these why questions is often, that's just how the language works. Spanish and English are different, and we're going to see different patterns from time to time. At worst, there is no logical justification for the pattern, and at best, there may be a very specific logical reason for a sentence in Spanish, but maybe we would be better off not knowing it. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. But for now, two much more powerful questions for developing your thinking in Spanish instead of why questions are, is this sentence correct? You know, is this a normal and natural sentence in Spanish? And if yes, how can we remember it? So is cual es tu nombre 
a natural and normal question in Spanish? And yes, it is. So how can we remember it? Now there are a lot of tactics for remembering things and I may do another video on this, but a really simple one to share right now is repetition. Say the phrase a hundred times. ¿Cuál es tu nombre? ¿Cuál es tu nombre? ¿Cuál es tu nombre? Say it a thousand times. I can promise you if you say ¿Cuál es tu nombre? at least a hundred times, spread out over a few weeks or even a few years, it will stick in your long-term memory. And at the end of the day, that's your only job as a Spanish student, to know what the natural sentence in Spanish is and then remember it. Now you don't necessarily need to know why a sentence is the way it is, but in chasing this, it leads to the other problem that I see regularly and that is logic-based decision-making at the time of speaking. To give an example of this, we're going to talk about the decision between ser versus estar in Spanish. Now in English we have one verb, to be, and in Spanish we have two, ser and estar. And every time you want to say I am, you are, or it is in Spanish, we have to choose between one of these two verbs. Now a lot of Spanish schools will teach you that ser is for permanent things and estar is for temporary things. I don't like this, I don't recommend this, and I don't teach it this way for several reasons. One. Permanent and temporary often don't work with ser and estar. Two, students sometimes get so attached to the idea that they think the permanent and temporary drive the choice of ser and estar when they don't, it leads to excessive logic-based decision-making. So for example, if I give the following sentence to a student, he is tall, and I ask them, how do we translate this into Spanish? I will often hear a response like this. Okay, so I know I need one of ser and estar. Height is fairly permanent. I guess it changes when you're growing up and maybe when you get really old, you start shrinking again. So maybe it's temporary when you're old and young, but for most of your life, it's pretty permanent. So I would say, el es alto. Is that correct? And I'll say, yes. But what about my hair is short? And then the student will say, well, hair length is definitely changing much faster than height. So I would say it's far less permanent. So much so that I think it's quite temporary. So I would go with mi pelo está corto. Is that correct? I'll say, no, that's not correct. We need to say mi pelo es corto. And then at this stage, a student will ask me, well, why? Why? Why is it like that? In an effort to try and understand the logic. So I hope you can see that trying to apply logic like this doesn't work from two perspectives. First, it takes time to process. We can't afford to go through a lengthy logic sequence every time we need to speak Spanish. And then two, Sometimes the logic completely falls apart anyway. Now to see this in reverse, a really interesting thinking in English problem that Spanish natives have to deal with when they're learning English is the verbs make and do. So while we have to go from one verb to be into two in Spanish, ser and estar, Spanish natives have to go from one in Spanish, a ser, into two in English to make and to do. Now when English schools teach make and do, they will often give lists like this. We need to use do with work, job and tasks, non-specific activities, housework, and we need to use make with food, drinks and meals, reactions, plans and decisions, speaking and sounds. So then when a Spanish native wants to say a sentence like this in English, voy a hacer una torta. Voy a hacer una torta. Now if English is your first language, the choice here is obvious. But if you're learning English, how would you think about this? Is it, I do a cake or I make a cake? Well, thinking back to that English class, make is for food, drinks and meals. So I guess I can say I'm going to make a cake. But then the next day the student hears someone saying, we're gonna go do lunch today. And then they're thinking, why do we say do lunch? I thought it was make with food and meals. And then all of a sudden they now have to go down a rabbit hole in an effort to try to understand the logic of these sentences. Now, as you can see, the process of trying to apply logic for communication can really get in the way. If you're an English native, I'm sure you're not thinking much about the logic of make a cake or do lunch. And you've probably never even thought that this would actually be really confusing for someone learning English. You would just say them, right, without needing to think about it. Now, this is where we need to get to with our Spanish. We need to just say, el es alto, mi pelo es corto, without thinking about it. And as I mentioned at the start of the video, what has worked for learning mucho gusto will work for learning anything in the language. So for ser versus estar, rather than trying to apply a logic test, simply practice each use of ser and estar as a separate important pattern that you need to get used to. Now let's say there are 20 uses of ser and 10 uses of estar, you need to practice each like it's its own pattern. So just practice it over and over. Soy alto, él es alto, somos altos, ella es alta. Mi madre es alta. Mi hermano no es alto. And if you're a Spanish native learning English, then they will need to practice, I'm going to make a cake. I'm making a big cake. They are making a small cake. He's making a chocolate cake. We made 
a birthday cake. Then, once you've internalized a pattern, pick a new pattern and then practice that. Now I know what I'm suggesting is actually a lot more work than just learning ser is permanent and estar is temporary, but language learning takes work. It's a big task. And trying to simplify things through logic will actually save you effort in the short term, but end up costing you in the long term when it comes to fluency and producing the language quickly and confidently in a conversation. Now, one really important point that I have to make here is that I don't want you to feel fatalistic on this topic. If you've been using logic-based decision-making for a long time, it doesn't mean you can't change it for the future. Now, as I mentioned, it happens naturally. So as you get better in Spanish, your thinking in Spanish will improve on its own. I've seen this time and time again with students in our school, but even if you've never seen this video, it will happen eventually, your thinking will get better, but of course we can speed up the process. So to quickly summarize the steps, you already know how to think in Spanish, you just need to scale up your efforts. This happens naturally as you keep growing your knowledge of the language. We need to stop doing the things that work against us. So avoid asking why questions when you encounter an unusual pattern. Instead, ask more powerful questions. Is this sentence correct? How can I remember it? Avoid using logic-based decision-making for speaking. Instead, practice each new pattern enough so that you can say it without thinking about the logic. Okay, if you have any other suggestions of tips and tactics that have helped you with thinking in Spanish, please share them below. If you enjoyed this video, then please like, subscribe, and share. And until next time, hablo mejor, entiende más.